Great things are rarely done alone. A special thank you to our 200th anniversary sponsors. Air Canada, Canadian Tire, Clearwater Seafoods, Lord Nelson Hotel and Suites, Michelin North America Canada Incorporated, Scotiabank, CBC, The Chronicle Herald and The Globe and Mail. We are proud to recognize our ongoing partnerships. Thank you for your generous support. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dalhousie University and to the great debate. It's wonderful to see such a full house. My name is Richard Florizone. I'm president of Dow, and I'm thrilled to be here for this scientific showdown. I promise you, you are in for an out-of-this-world experience. But before we begin, please join me in welcoming Elder Jerry Musqua LeBlanc to provide an opening blessing. Elder Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Jerry, a terrific reminder that we're here on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, that we're all treaty people. It's great to see so many young people here tonight and to feel the waves of energy in this room. In fact, I'm told we have more than 300 students from grades 7 through 12 with us who've been on campus this afternoon as part of STEM Fest. Let's hear some noise from those grades 7 to 12 kids. There we go. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. So STEM Fest, they have a, they have a, a range of experiential hands-on opportunities in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So I'm glad. Sounds like they've had a terrific time. Dell, all revved up for the debate. You know, 2018, this debate is part of a really special year for us here at Dalhousie. Uh, we're celebrating our 200th anniversary, and we've been using it to reflect on our university's journey and to think about our third century. The year's been filled with events and performances across our faculties and campuses, and in fact, across the country, even with a coast-to-coast -coast alumni tour that we did by bus. And the response so far has been phenomenal. We've had more than 15,000 people attend our uh, events, and uh, we're just coming now into the final weeks, it being November. You know, from the beginning, from two centuries ago, uh, Dalhousie always aspired to the very highest academic standards and to be of service to the community. Two centuries later, we've grown from what was a little college by the sea into a national university and the top research university here in Atlantic Canada. Dal is now a place where you can explore the ocean's depths, the heights of our atmosphere, and everything in between. So in our medical school, for example, you'll find 12,000 zebrafish used in cutting-edge research on childhood cancer. And out in the world's seas, including some of the researchers you, you'll hear from tonight, we've got researchers involved in tagging sharks and other marine animals to get a glimpse into their movements and migrations, habitat use, and looking at response to the changing ocean climate. Meanwhile, astrophysicists at Dow are using advanced telescopes to peer more than 12 billion light years back in time to observe the creation of a mega galaxy at the edge of our observable universe. These are just a few examples of groundbreaking Dow projects that respond directly to global challenges like climate change and pursue humanity's interest in exploring the unknown and our place in the universe. So tonight is about the ocean and it's about space. So I want to hear, who's here for oceans? <laughs> oh, wow. oh, That's pretty good. Now, I'm Dell president, and, and you know, I'm very proud of our ocean work, but you know, I, 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 I'm like most kids, I was pretty fond of space, even though I was rejected from the astronaut program in 1992. <laughs> Where, a few years ago, when Commander Hadfield was on campus, I, I showed him my rejection letter, and he said that was the competition that he won, so I wasn't in bad company. <laughs> Who's here for space? Let's hear some noise. <laughs> yeah, wow. Hey. Let's not, wow, I don't take anything for granted. I have, I have no idea who's going to win that. So look, as I've, let me just end by saying, as I've said so many times throughout my presidency, nobody does anything alone. 
we all know that as individuals, right? That we stand on the shoulders of our parents and our family members and friends. But that's just as true for universities as it is for individuals. We can only do things with the support of the public, the support of our sponsors. So it's only uh, appropriate that I just hand it off by saying that our 200th anniversary celebration couldn't have happened without generous partners and supporters like Clearwater Seafoods, who, are, who is the Great Debates presenting sponsor. And so it's now my pleasure to welcome Christine Penny, the VP of Sustainability and Public Affairs at Clearwater to the stage. Please give her a great space and oceans welcome. Christine. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Penny, Vice President of Sustainability and Public Affairs at Clearwater Seafoods. And Clearwater is an incredibly proud sponsor of Dalhousie's 200th anniversary celebrations. As an engaged and active member in the community, both regionally and internationally, Clearwater is absolutely thrilled to be a presenting sponsor for tonight's great debate. We feel extremely fortunate to have a world-class university on our doorstep, generating high-quality ocean research that helps us understand the species that we're harvesting and their environment, as well as educating our future leaders on the importance of sustainability and protecting our oceans. Many of Clearwater's 1,500 employees in Atlantic Canada are proud DAL alumni. So the question to be tackled tonight, our next frontier, whether it be space or the ocean, is one that is fascinating, complex, and truly inspiring. As someone who works for a seafood company, I promise to try to remain as unbiased as possible. <laughs> to tell you a little bit more about what's in store for tonight, please join me in welcoming DAL Oceanographer and Canada Excellence Research Chair, Dr. Doug Wallace, and Dean of Science, Dr. Chris Moore, to the stage. Hi. So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, wow, what a crowd. Here, here in Atlantic Canada, we've got a really new, and here, including here at Dow, we've got a really new and exciting initiative underway. It's called the Ocean Frontier Institute. Some of you might have heard about it. It's big and it's bold. And uh, if we get it right, it will allow us to go places where no one's gone before in terms of uh, how we study and understand and also protect our ocean. So the, idea for this, for, so the idea for this debate came with a vision for this uh, new institute. We stumbled across the idea to have a, maybe a debate focused on the concept of frontier, which would be a great way to kick off the new institute, but also celebrate Dow's 200th birthday, and also take a peek into the next 200 years, into the unknown. Why ocean frontier? What is a frontier anyway? So to me, uh, as a kid, my idea of frontier was pretty much the garden fence, a stretch of highway in front of our house, about 300 meters long, from the bus stop up the road to the sweet shop down the road, which, under the very strict instructions of my mother, was the edge of my known universe, my frontier. But as we experience more, our idea of frontier becomes more abstract. So frontier can imply the edge of knowledge, the unexplained or the unmapped. The word conveys excitement and danger, both because of imagined opportunities but also because of unknown risks. And always, for human beings, lurks the idea of discovering new life forms, or having them discover us, or finding new ways of living or surviving. So tonight, we're going to get a diverse view of frontiers from some very experienced people. As human beings have populated the land masses of our planet, both as residents and often increasingly as tourists, we've really got two frontiers left space and the ocean. What are, what's out there? What's the nature of these frontiers? How do we get there and how do we understand them? These are some of the issues that we're going to debate tonight. And now I'll hand over to Chris Moore, our Dean of Science. Thank you, Doug. So as Doug said, I'm Chris Moore, I'm the Dean of Science here at Dalhousie, and I have to say I've been anticipating this event uh, for about two years now since we began our early planning meetings, and it's wonderful that this day is finally here. And my job tonight, I have the distinct honor to introduce our moderator for tonight's debate, Jay Ingram. Jay is one of Canada's most popular science writers and broadcasters. He has spent his career promoting science literacy through a wide variety of forms, 
Some of you will remember he hosted two national science programs in Canada, Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio and, and The Daily Planet on Discovery Channel Canada. He's written 15 books, which have been translated into 16 languages. His two most recent books, The Science of Why, Volumes 1 and 2, are all about answering questions about the universe, the unknown, and ourselves. He is the co-founder of the organization Beakerhead, which promotes science literacy through innovative workshops for science communicators, school programs for science teachers, sciences art installations, and much, much more. Jay's work has been recognized with six honorary degrees. He is a member of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He is truly one of Canada's great science communicators. Tonight, He'll help our debaters navigate some of the most compelling questions about exploring the unknown, deep underwater and high above the atmosphere, all in his usual fun and engaging fashion. Please join me now in welcoming to the stage, Jay Ingram. Are you students the ones that have been making all that noise? <laughs> have you run out of energy or can you make noise again? Let's hear it. <laughs> and what about you adults? Can't you make a little bit of noise? Just don't put your back out or anything when you do it. <laughs> So this is going to be a great, fun event. Uh, unlike uh, any science that you were taught in school or in university, this is good. there's going to be a little bit of competition tonight. I just want to say something, although Doug Wallace covered the idea of frontiers very well, um, you might be surprised to know that at least in North America, the word frontier was really really became popular in the 19th century as European settlers in both Canada and the United States moved westward, settling first on you know, the Maritimes, then Quebec, Ontario, and the Prairie Provinces. And the leading edge of that settling was considered the frontier. But it was a little bit of a mistake, right? Because there were already First Nations people living there, so it wasn't an empty land. But what we're talking about tonight space and the oceans, they're not empty by any means, but they contain so many unknown things and perhaps, well in both, unknown living creatures. And so they are true frontiers. And you know, the word frontier is kind of cool to me because it has this sense of mystery in it. It has this feeling that you want to go there and just see what it's like. And if you're a student, you know, this night may actually influence you to think about whether ocean research or ocean exploration or space research or space exploration might be something that you uh, want to do one day. So, I'm going to introduce the six debaters on the two teams. I'm going to bring them out one by one. And once I've done that, I'm going to tell you how it's going to work. Uh, because there's going to be talk to and fro, but we're going to keep it fairly organized until they get excited, and then who knows what's going to happen. So, I'll introduce the space group first, and sitting right here is going to be Catherine Sullivan. She's a former astronaut, and she is ambassador at large for the National Aeronautics and Space Museum. Of course, I forgot they're coming in from that side. Sorry, folks. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. So welcome, Catherine Sullivan, please. <laughs> Christian Marois is an astrophysicist. He's looking, he searches space for planets around other stars. He might even be looking for extraterrestrial life. And Josh Kutrick is one of Canada's newest astronauts, and he's come all the way from the Space Center in Houston, Texas. <laughs> and 
now I'm standing on the right side. So, Antje Boitis, she's a uh, ocean specialist at the University of Bremen in Germany, flew all the way from Bremen to be here tonight. Mark Abbott is President and Director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. <laughs> and finally, a Dalhousie scientist, Boris Vorm. <laughs> now, you might notice that I have a turtle on the front of my t-shirt, which might make you think I'm on the ocean side, but turtles have gone to space. <laughs> so I'm perfectly neutral. Here's how this is gonna go. Each speaker gets three minutes, and we're timing them, to make their first pitch for either space or the oceans. And then there'll be a short period of time, probably a little like three minutes, maybe a bit more, where the other side gets to argue with them. It's called a rebuttal in debates. And then that's the way it's gonna go. A little talk, some rebuttal, talk, rebuttal. We get to the end of that, we're gonna take maybe half an hour to allow you, all of you, to ask questions. And there are two microphones in each aisle, one microphone in each aisle, and we'll ask you at that point to go to the microphone, ask your question, and then we're gonna have to decide who won. Does either team have a preference going first? Aha! <laughs> Antje Boitius is gonna kick it off for the ocean side. <laughs> so, when I was 10 years old in 1977, deep diving scientists dove to what they presumed was ocean desert, lava flows they thought, empty of life. But what they found, you see here, they found the most densest biomass they have ever seen in the ocean. They found worms, tube worms that you see here giant white worms as thick as my arm, two meters long, with heads red from blood. And they found precipitating chimneys that grew while they were watching, precipitating minerals that spew hot black boiling water. And they looked at it and they didn't understand, how is this possible, an oasis of life at depths where we believed there was no life? No sunlight, no plants, nothing to eat, and these animals got so large that they would have no equivalent on Earth. We figured out sometime later that these animals team up with bacteria that can tap into Earth's deep energy, that can use methane, hydrogen, sulfide, and then fix CO2 without sunlight and feed the worms with sugar. And today we know so many more examples of this deep enigmatic ocean life we're just beginning to tap into their secrets. For example, my team found cells in the subsurface of the ocean, cells that defy aging. They can grow a thousand year per cell, and we don't know how they do that. Will they tell us the secret of how to age in youth? We found microbes that eat all the methane that comes from the seafloor, not letting anything reach the atmosphere, so preventing us from getting too hot. So microbes that you don't have to pay for that make planet Earth habitable. We found so many secrets of how life can tap into the energy of Earth and we even think we have the clue to the origin of life. At these depths, at the high temperatures, at the pressure, there is an opportunity for life to grow from building blocks that are made in situ. Now, don't you want to come dive with us? And don't you want to find out what the oceans have in stock for you? New medicine, potentially solutions to our foul energy system. So many things the oceans will do for us in our future. We welcome you to Team Ocean. <laughs> Team 
Jim's face, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> it, it really is. And I, I should start this evening by saying I'm going to be a terrible debater because this evening... <laughs> great. What we're, we're trying to do in space is similar. Of course, we're looking for new life. But to answer the, the deepest, most fundamental questions about our existence here and where we're going in the future, we need to, we need to be looking for that life off the planet as well as on the planet. So um, that's why I'm involved with space. And I, I think we have similar pursuits, but we need to look as far as we can. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Just the reaction I wanted. So, in my view, really, outer space and inner space are the same, only you have guaranteed aliens in the ocean. <laughs> and lots of them. And we have only, we have only made friends with about one-tenth of them. One-tenth of them only have a name. And we haven't figured out a way to talk to them, although there is intelligent life in there. Dolphins, for example. So, um, yes, I get the pursuit of life in outer space, but how long are we going to look before we make friends with those guys? Whereas here, we have the opportunity to do it each and every day. But there are, these <laughs> other, there are these other planets in the solar system, and we now know, thanks to space exploration, thousands of others beyond our solar system. And the helpful things that Team Ocean did was show us that the definition of where we should look for life that we had when I was your age was dead flat wrong much broader places to look for life, and we found them, as Anshu said. So now what that's helping us do is look at other planets, and notably Mars, and maybe the Jupiter's moon Europa, Saturn's Jupiter's moon Europa, and understand, well, wait a minute. It seems life likely did exist there before, and likely doesn't now. So there is the how did we come to be and what is our fate in the future. But there is also how did this planet that we live on and take so much for granted, how did that come to be? And what conditions and circumstances may have tipped a place like Mars from once upon a time being maybe as pleasant as this place into some place that none of us could exist? So if we really want to know where we are going, we have to go looking outward. So, so to, to my esteemed colleague. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the gloves are coming off. <laughs> The, the challenge, and we're involved at Woods Hole Oceanographic with working with NASA to look on ocean worlds in our solar system. In fact, a lot of the moons around Jupiter and Saturn probably have more water than Earth. But every mission is 20 to 30 to 50 years away. Most of you, well, I'll be gone, but you will be uh, superannuated by then. <laughs> and the problem is that, uh, you know, Oceans are here today. We can make those explorations in our lifetime, and we mm. have to make them. It's not only interesting science, it's important science. And let me add the rules that you have, that you pose to yourself. I mean, like, no returning of samples. How sad is this? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to be careful here. Uh, I don't think anybody here will debate the fact that life has originated from the ocean. But there are theories out there that life might have been on Mars and that contaminated Earth. So life that you're seeing in the ocean might be extraterrestrial in the first place. Or maybe even coming from outside our solar system. Like a recent asteroid that was discovered that zooming to the solar system that might have life foundation and maybe going to see the another system or another planet around another star. So Mark, are you arguing that uh, information you can gain quickly is necessarily more valuable than information that is harder to gain? <laughs> I would say, <laughs> since so many fisheries are at great risk, and we've already seen essentially the elimination of the cod fishery in the Northwest Atlantic, that it's fine to talk about life on other planets. That's great. I think it's wonderful science. <laughs> but the urgency here is much more intense. Okay, so we're gonna just suspend that, is it urgency or is it the promise of things even more bizarre that are in the ocean? I'm sure we're gonna be able to come back to that, but because Catherine Sullivan kicked this all off so elegantly, why don't you uh, come up and uh, give us your address? 
Oh, all right. Yeah. Flip the slides mm -hmm. So I just started with a story of when she was 10 years old, and I'll pick up a similar theme, although they were different years. <laughs> um, when I was a young girl, your age, I was watching the start of the space age. When I was born, there wasn't a space age. Mark and I have that in common. We didn't want to admit it, but it's come out. Um, <laughs> and so I watched these first grand adventures of human beings trying to do really hugely complex technical things that put their lives and their metals at risk that nobody ever had done before. Uh, and I went through a phase of debating with myself, is this really worth it? It is expensive. It does take time. It doesn't happen quickly. You know, try to think of something you've never done before and no other human has ever done before. You're going to have lots of fits and starts. You're going to have to learn your way there. I watched all that happen, all the way through to people on the moon and then human beings living and working in space for extended periods of time, as Josh will do sometime in the future. And what I came to conclude is the biggest reason to pursue the space frontier is because it is the place where the most transformative, daring, difficult challenges lie. And if you put a group together, a national group or an international group, that stays the course and tackles them, they will have to overcome the greatest array, the greatest variety, the most difficult combination of science and engineering and technology challenges. And that will generate a cascade of benefits, tangible real benefits in the form of new businesses, in the form of new technologies, in the form of things we now carry in our pockets. That will generate a cascade of benefits that will be so transformational to life on Earth. So the space frontier is a place where we can both really radically pursue an understanding of our place in the cosmos, it is a place from which we can look back and understand this planet in a way that is absolutely critical to how we live our lives and to understanding the ocean. Space oceanography has transformed the science. And finally, it is one of the few arenas that is so unifyingly aspirational that countries that otherwise are openly hostile to each other manage to come together and find some common ground and realize that we are one species on this planet and do some pretty extraordinary things, like build a one million pound structure that is over our heads right now, that is larger than a football field, even a Canadian football field, <laughs> and that has had human beings from multiple countries living in it continuously for fully 20 years. That is the one place where we do that. And and by the way, Mark gave you a sense of the absolute scale of the numbers, and they are ginormous, more zeros than you want to think about. But scale them to the well-being of the countries that are pursuing this. And in my country, for example, in the United States, the current budget of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, my alma mater, is about eight-tenths of one penny from every tax dollar. So if you want to suggest to me that one of the wealthiest countries on this planet cannot afford eight-tenths of a penny to pursue the challenges on a frontier that unites and inspires humankind globally like nothing else ever has done. I have traveled the world and talked to people that were watching television when Neil Armstrong jumped onto the moon. You know what? They never say to me, when you went to the moon. They never say, when Neil landed on the moon. They all say, when we landed on the moon. That's worth at least eight tenths of a penny. <laughs> so, so, so Dr. Sullivan and I are gonna go the war of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> because it's interesting, when you look at the ocean, it, one of the big transformations in the last 30 years has been the rise of global trade. Over 90% of the trade crosses the ocean worldwide. If you look at the undersea cables that move internet country to country, 97% of it goes across those cables. Very little of it goes up into space. Over half the world's population lives within 100 miles of the coastline. Uh, it's a huge, huge place. And yet, in the US, we spend 16, 17 billion a year on NASA. 
600 million a year on oceanography. So uh, Kathy's point eight cents, uh, we're beep, much beep. less on ocean Are, research. Here, time out, time out. Point of order, <laughs> sir. <laughs> point of order. Have, my most recent job actually was running the agency in the United States that is the Oceans and Atmosphere Agency. It's called NOAA. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It is hardly hundreds of millions. It's a $6 billion agency. So I will agree there's a significant multiple between NOAA and NASA. But you lost, you lost a few zeros there, Dr. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> That's the research side. Uh, you do weather forecasts on the satellites, too. I, I, would, uh, I don't know if it's fair to do so or not, but I'd like to pile onto that. I, I really like thinking about that thought of the ocean as being everything in our world right now, because it, what he said is true. Uh, but I like to do thought experiments, I like to think back, and surely there was a time, maybe five, six hundred years ago, when people were having a similar discussion, and they were maybe wondering about a day when the oceans would account for all that, when the oceans would account for 97% of our commerce, and our communications, and our way of life. And this was a discussion maybe in our minds that was happening at a time when no one had yet crossed an ocean. And I sometimes wonder if we're not sitting at, that, at a similar decision point, but we're talking about space. There's a well-known saying out there that space is the new ocean. There are well-known facts out there that you know, we are at the beginning of a revolution in terms of space economics, space technology. It's worth an amount of money right now that is expected to triple in the next you know, five, six years. These are amazing stats. We are at the beginning of a transformation, perhaps, from this dependency of life as we know it on the ocean uh, to one that's going to move into space. And so I think for that reason, but um, you know, Josh, you need to think about what did men do right? when they arrived on moon? They turned around to look to this blue marble and wonder about the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> that, that picture is iconic and it's not for nothing that we all say, you know, today we can see the surface of moon and Mars, but we cannot look into our depths. And we don't, we have to look into our depths because what we are doing is we are, we surface people. At this time we are changing everything down to the deepest depths where there is so many treasures still to unravel. And uh, that's why if we have to talk about money, if we have to talk about decision making, we just got to understand what's going on with our planet. It's the planet, the celestial body where we know we have life and we might lose part of it for lack of knowledge, for lack of understanding. So I think it's the perfect things that astronauts do. They go to space to look back and say, this tiny little blue marble is worth thinking about. So that, that, that's true, but I, you know, I would offer a counter in that we would, we would feel foolish. Sometimes, you know, there's a saying out there that says, well, the dino at least we're better than the dinosaurs because the dinosaurs <laughs> never had a chance to see their end coming. We can see ours, uh, it may be coming, and you know, I just feel that it would be so unfortunate to be out in the future past that end, and having spent all our time and energy looking at our planet, which we know, we know factually and scientifically to be excessively vulnerable, for a host of reasons. Our survival here is precarious. It's vulnerable for asteroids, it's vulnerable for climate change, it's extremely vulnerable to the threat of us, us ruining it. And so I wonder why we would focus only on looking inwards at our own little world when we know, we know for a fact that we're that vulnerable. We need to look further. We need to find, quite frankly, new places for, for future generations to live. So I think it's pretty even so far, but, <laughs> but I do have to say, space is the new ocean. That cuts. That, 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 that's a harsh statement. I, I stole that. that. I didn't make that up. <laughs> But we're going to move on. There's going to be much more to say, I'm sure. So, uh, Mark Abbott, president of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Great. Institution. Mark. Thank you. So, so Josh gets to wear one cool flight suit. I'm wearing mine. <laughs> That's what you get to do when you're the director of Oceanographic Institution. Uh, I'd like to say, actually, what we do at Woods Hole and a lot of the ocean institutions around the world is we do three things. We explore, we discover, and we understand. And I think what you want to see up here is what we do is really cool stuff. Our stuff is really uh, important. These are organisms <laughs> <laughs> from what's known as the ocean twilight zone. It's the area from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters. 
There's not enough sunlight for photosynthesis, so plants can't grow there. But there's enough sunlight so that the organisms that live there know when it's day or night. And some of them actually migrate up every night to feed and then drop down uh, during the, the daytime to hide from uh, predators in the dark. It's the largest animal migration on the planet. It is not known at all. It's thought anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times the amount of biomass uh, that's harvested every year lives in this zone of the ocean beyond any sort of national borders. And yet, nations around the world are saying, here's a great food source. Here is something we can harvest, exploit, turn into feed for aquaculture or for chicken farms or whatever. We're going to go out and start using this vast frontier just like we did with the prairies before we even understand it. So we need the science to go out there. But we do partner with NASA because NASA is the leader in robotic technology. It may take 30 to 40 years to make those robots, but they're out there. <laughs> but they do bring a lot of capability that we're really trying to work in partnership with NASA as well as using them as what I call the tall pole, that pole that you climb up to look down and see the forest or the grassland around you looking back uh, at that blue marble. So this is science that we think the animals are way cooler than what you will find in little microfossils on Mars. Uh, we think the technology is pretty cool, but again, it's really that important science, that understanding, to look at animals that look like alien meets Dr. Seuss. So that's really what we want to understand. That's why we think ocean is that vast frontier worthy of knowing the bottom of the ocean better than we know the surface of Venus, which is where we are today. Thank you. Space people, he basically said, is the stuff you do are the tools that they use to explore. <laughs> I just, just want to emphasize that. We, and we, uh, this isn't an argument, but a very important uh, point to be made, maybe, is that a lot of NASA's robotics, which he's speaking about, are made here in Canada by Canadians. So. Uh, <laughs> but, but let's do notice which way the robotics have flown. They've flowed from the space frontier, where the, the, the more demanding challenges were encountered first, <laughs> into the ocean arena. So there's sort of doers and users. Just <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I meant inventors and users. Yeah. But. Although we don't want to talk about the NASA missions that end up in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you, mean, you mean along with the sled of robotics that Bob Ballard lost? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's all sorts of exploratory stuff yeah. on the bottom of oceans. That's true. But I think the exploration is really interesting because one of the things in NASA is to look for life. They're looking at these, what they're calling ocean worlds. And they're basically they're looking for planets that have water, that have life. Guess what? We found one. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and why is all your life uh, green and kind of flat and not uh, spiky as our life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think it's a fair point to put on the, on the board at this juncture that this one thing the two frontiers have in common is they give us challenging and exciting perspectives on the origins and futures of life, uh, both life on this planet and life in the universe. Um, I, so I, I have a PhD in oceanography from Dalhousie <laughs> University, which... <laughs> <laughs> which Jay, as, ever, as a good television moderator, did not want to acknowledge, because then there might be a blurring of these you know, diametrically opposed yeah. sides here. Um, so I'm going to play a little off record on this question of life and where it goes next and put a little marker down for Josh, who's yet to give his um, couple of minutes. Because as an oceanographer and an earth scientist, I have a bit of a problem with this let's go colonize other worlds. It strikes me, it, the lifeboat theory that's called, right? We're screwing this one up really badly, so let's learn how to go somewhere else. Um, number one, that will be the world's most exclusive gated com community. It will benefit a few and abandon the rest to first order. Um, and frankly, as Mark has been saying, it will cost a whole lot more than the investment in just stewarding this planet better. The problem is, you all know this, 
boldly go where no man has gone before is a lot more exciting than clean up your room. <laughs> <laughs> Are we, are we allowed to disagree with our own town? Yeah, <laughs> sure. It's a free for all now. You can say whatever you want. Because, because something that is now recurrent from both sides is this idea that space takes so much time and costs so much money, and all of which could be better spent maybe or more efficiently. Um, I'm a test pilot. I like to think about aviation, and I ask people to make this comparison sometimes. So, what you think it would have felt like in 1908, five years after the first airplane flew, a fundamentally different time for humanity, and at that time you could probably have counted the number of pilots and airplanes on your two hands. And then we went forward, not, only, not even 10 years, and all of a sudden we had thousands of aircraft and tens of thousands of pilots on countries all over the world. And when we talk about the expense of space and the time that space takes, the money and the commitment that time takes, you have to make that argument in, in, in light of that, in light of looking forward and asking yourself just how much can humans do when we look back at previous examples. And I don't think there's frankly any precedent for what we're about to do in space. It's really exciting and we're going to defy everyone's imagination. We've done that in just the last 10 years. We're going to do it to a much larger extent in the but next Josh, 10. how many people have traveled into outer space, roughly? Hundreds? Hundreds. It's hundreds. on the scale of hundreds. How many correct. people have gone to the deepest part of the ocean? Three. Much less, yeah. So. <laughs> Where do we have to do some catch up? <laughs> I mean, you people are dying from the ocean per year compared to dying in space. I mean, the ocean is much more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Christian, uh, you just had the floor. Why don't you come up? And Christian is interested in uh, the possibilities of life in, on other planets other than our own solar system. So it's right in line with what we've been talking about. So being the astronomer here, I'm going to be the dooms person. So you see Earth now with water. Our future is an Earth without water. So why bother with the ocean? It's going to go away. <laughs> We're doomed. Yep, the only way out is to go to space. In a billion years, OK, so don't pack your bags right now, OK? The sun is warming up. It's consuming its hydrogen fuel contracting, warming up, and Earth is receiving more and more energy from the sun. So no matter the climate change or, or, or human impact on, on the climate, Earth is warming up by itself, a very slow rate, not as fast as what we're doing. But at some point, the Earth's surface temperature is going to go to 60 degrees Celsius to 100. So the ocean's going to boil and go out in the atmosphere. And it's going to continue. The sun's going to go to, at some point, to a red giant and its surface is going to go almost to the Earth uh, orbit, and the surface of the Earth is going to be magma. It's going to be dead. So our only way out is to go in space, colonize Mars, go to the moon of our solar system, like Jupiter and Saturn. And I would go even further. We need to find these Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. We need you know, instruments. We're designing them now, but the new students in the room will be able to use them in 10, 20, or 30 years. So we're going to be finding these pale blue dots around other stars, we'll be able to characterize the atmosphere, see if there's ocean, climate, clouds, seasons, uh, even if there's vegetation on their surface. We can all do this remotely. And the young kids in the room will be able to invent maybe new ways to bend the laws of physics and the nature to be able to design new propulsion systems so to be able to visit these places uh, in our lifetime, you know, warp nine, and then you're there in a few hours. So, we saw you know, life appear in the ocean, and then it went up to the land. And there's a trend. <laughs> <laughs> next step is to go up to space. That's the next frontier. So space is not just the next frontier. It's the final frontier. It's not just a journey of exploration, of discovery of the unknown. Now, there's, we know from the Kepler spacecraft, there are billions of Earth-sized planet orbiting star in the Milky Way. And billions of them have an ocean probably similar to Earth. So what's one ocean compared to the billion available in the Milky Way? <laughs> For young kids to study and learn about the differences, the different you know, life appearing on this planet. Maybe there's dinosaur roaming on these planets right now and nobody knows. So it's only up to us to look up and, and explore the universe. Thank you.
gave away a secret that she has the secret love for the oceans and I have to give away a secret too, so I'm supporting space. Uh, our station in Antarctic will have a space mission, one of these, like what if humans have to live on Mars in the future and those kind of things. And I was surprised when I looked at it, it was a, a project about growing cucumbers and salad leaves and maybe strawberries. So I looked at it and I, I went to Bremen and they told me, oh, we have the best mission control room sorted out for watching habitability of cucumbers in Antarctica. And so I think space people know how to sell their bits because when I went into that mission control room, I saw regular cucumbers growing. <laughs> <laughs> there was a space engineer, you have to understand a space engineer, full trade space engineer talking to me, Houston, Houston, do we have a problem? Do we have a, a control of the strawberries? We didn't, so. <laughs> So I give it away to space. You can sell something that might be as simple as growing a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he is saying that they're taking the long view, yeah. the long. So and that's you aren't. The crew, they're taking the long view, and that's pretty impressive data, a billion years from now. Um, I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to make the point that the average lifetime of a species on this planet is around 10 million years, according to the paleontological record. Uh, we're about a million years or so into it, not actually for our species, for our genus, and it doesn't look like we're going to make 10 million if they're going the way we're going. So in order to make the 10 million, maybe even the 1 billion, hopefully, uh, we need to take care of this place first. And taking care of this place means taking care of our life support system, and that's in the ocean, that's why I study it. <laughs> However, to follow up on Dr. Sullivan's comment about what I call the Tang phenomenon, remember, <laughs> us folks of a certain generation, remember NASA used to say that the space program developed Tang, which was this horrible orange-flavored powder. <laughs> <laughs> but Christian has actually solved the problem of warp speed. How do you go faster than the speed of light? So I just, wow, what a technology spin-off. I mean, I want to invest. <laughs> That's why, yeah, kids in the room, we need to find a solution. <laughs> Yeah, they're always putting it on you guys, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> We're counting on you. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know that I believe we'll ever go faster than the speed of light. I'm a fairly firm believer in relativity, but, but, I would, <laughs> but I would ask you to think, because as I've made the point already tonight, there was a time when there was an auditorium with people like you, and they were talked to, and they believed that, for example, going faster than the speed of sound would always be impossible. And we completely blew that out of the water. Um, it's worth thinking about. It's really worth thinking about. That's recent history. I thought the cucumber was a pretty cutting remark, too. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of surprised you guys haven't come back with something on that. I, I'm a geologist. I don't do cucumbers. <laughs> Now for me, it's quite simple. It, it comes down to how far you can see. If you're deep into the ocean, you can probably see a few feet in front of you. If you're in space, you're seeing 13 billion light years away in space. There's just no comparison. OK, but wait, but wait, but wait. <laughs> Th that, that just means we have cooler visuals, OK? <laughs> More places to go to. <laughs> ah, well. And, and to their credit, you know, this, the space cucumber idea, that the answer to that is not a funny one, but it's a serious one. Um, that, I that is a, a great challenge. Scientists all over the world are working on. A lot of them are right here in Canada working on it. The idea of further closing the human system. So we've, we're coming close to closing the human survival system on the International Space Station right now. That's why we built it. But to go further, to go there are places where NASA and other space agencies of the world, like the Canadian Space Agency, are planning to go, we have to further close that. And one of the last big and actually really difficult hurdles is it when it comes to food and, and sustainability. Um, so there, there's a reason why research behind growing cucumbers in space costs so much. It's very, very difficult. And if you read The Martian or saw the movie, potatoes are pretty important, too. <laughs> 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 Boris. Boris Vorm for the uh, ocean side. <laughs> So when I saw that Josh was coming out in his cool spacesuit, I thought, I need a prop, I need a prop. So this is all I could come up with, sorry. Not quite as uh, impressive. But I want to bring this back to people. And I want to bring this back to every single one of us. 
okay? So I get the point that space exploration, this exploration of outer space, fuels our, and supports our imagination, our technology development. But as we've heard, inner space exploration does the same thing. And also, that inner space of the ocean actually supports our lives. My life, your life, everybody's lives, right? And the lives of all those millions of other life forms that we already know that are on this planet. And then the millions that we don't know, that we haven't explored that yet, we haven't talked to yet. So to me, that's the main argument for, for looking deeper into the ocean. And whenever we care enough to look deeply into the ocean, we learn new things and we learn crucial things. Just last week, for example, we've learned that the ocean, thankfully, absorbs more than 90, quite a bit more than 90% of the excess heat that we generate in the atmosphere through greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's threatening the stability of our climate. We're learning that ocean nutrients are crucial in early childhood development, particularly brain development. We're learning about the health benefits of living near the oceans. People who live near the ocean actually, everything else being equal, live longer and live more healthy and more productive lives. Just a few minutes sitting by the ocean, actually, you can measure this, um, lowers your heart rate, lowers your stress hormones, makes you more happy. And I'm not an expert in this. I don't have the first high experience, but my inkling is that sitting in outer space doesn't quite have the same effect on you. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding is that if I want, wanted to try this, it would turn me into a radioactive popsicle. So <laughs> it's not quite the same. I get the fascination. <clears throat> and I get that you need that elaborate technology that takes a long time to, to develop and that has these spin-offs, these multi-billion dollar instruments, like the space station, that's out there with a few people orbiting Earth, watching back down on us, and that's important. But this really brings me to my last and most important point. Exploring outer space is the privilege of very few. Very lucky few that have either the means or the skills or the support to go out there and hopefully come back to tell their story. The ocean is all of our frontier. Space exploration necessarily is exclusive. The ocean is inclusive. In a way, that means that we can all participate in learning more about it. We can all participate in understanding it more deeply, caring about it more deeply, and taking better care of it collectively. This is not about some few. This is about everybody. This is our inclusive common frontier. So look at these two aquanauts uh, from West Papua. Do you think that their exploration is worthwhile, eye-opening, important, transforming? Do you think it's time for us to make the exploration of our next frontier as diverse and inclusive as we possibly can? Well, if you do, it's the ocean for you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, guys. <laughs> so, Boris, you, you made the point earlier on that uh, the large proportion of humankind that now lives within 100 kilometers of the ocean. But it is 100% of humankind that has the stars and the moon over their heads every single day and every single night. Uh, and there is exploration, there is the physical opportunity to go do somewhere or to be part of building something that does exploration. But there is also just the imagination. And first and foremost, I will wager for all six of us here, and I will wager for all 350 young people out here, first and foremost the thing we need to do is fire imagination and trigger dreams and trigger curiosity that then becomes the impetus to develop a skill set, the impetus to choose a path through life, and the impetus to help drive human progress on various frontiers. So uh, we don't all have to go to be entranced and inspired and enthralled by a frontier. And having done both, yes, hovering at the spacecraft window does have the same effect as wait, wetting your toes in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard to debate you because I agree so much. But for the, for the sake of argument, I was standing by um, on the edge of the ocean yesterday. And you know, here in Canada, it's actually it's pretty profound, right? Like, when you look back, you have 6,000 kilometer of solid continent behind you. When you look out from where I live, you have 6,000 kilometer of ocean in front of you. You know almost nothing about what's in front of you. We know a few things about what's behind us. 
And then you look up at the stars and you realize the, the extent of our ignorance. And to me, the, it, there's awe, there's curiosity, there's wonder, and there's humility. And to me, that's the most important aspect of the emotional connection to both ocean and space that makes us humble. And I think that becomes us well. I like what you say. I think it's very true. I'd like to go back to one of your points just a little bit deeper. We're talking about some of what we know about the ocean, how the amount of heat and carbon dioxide it absorbs, what we know about the importance of life in the ocean. Um, and I think that to make those points, you have to acknowledge space a little bit, because the truth of the matter is that a lot of what we know about space, or sorry, what we know about the ocean comes from space. The truth of the matter is that one of the, the greatest benefits of space exploration that we've benefited from to date uh, has been a better understanding of our planet. It's satellites in space that have lent us this detailed understanding of the oceans, the role, the criticality, you know, nature, critical nature of the oceans. It's things that we build right here in Canada, radar sats, one, two, three, constellations, um, the SWAT experiment about to launch. These are extremely precise devices that are providing us with a, a ton of new information that we didn't know before about how our Earth functions. So there's not really too much to debate in terms of how important the oceans are to our survivability here, but I do think you have to acknowledge that a lot of the knowledge we get uh, comes, in fact, from space. So we have to go to space in order to understand our oceans, is what I'm saying. That, that may be true, but it's still important to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Silvero made that point here a few weeks ago. And you have to get wet because you have to become intimate with the creatures that live in this ocean, and you don't see those from space. So to give you an example, the most abundant living thing on Earth is a small, single-celled organism called Prochlorococcus, and it's fueling our geochemical cycles, it's producing a lot of the oxygen we breathe, it's the most abundant living thing in the known universe, and we didn't even know it existed until 1989. That's why we have to get wet, and that's why we have to look more closely. I, I want to uh, align with Boros on that one. Uh, the, the power of satellites for teaching us about the ocean, how it circulates, what its temperatures are, some of the primary productivity and the, uh, the, the plant growth in the upper oceans is huge. But that bare, that's, that's like saying if your doctor only touched the skin on your hand, she could make all the diagnoses that she needs about your health. It just isn't so. You do have to get into the third dimension and into the living dimension. But the question I keep coming back to in, in my own self-debates about this is, I said earlier NASA consumes eight-tenths of a penny, that's actually a bit high, of each US um, federal expenditure. The agency I ran at best is like two cents out of a dollar. Um, and so you know, that makes one whole gigantic penny. So I'm curious about the audience reaction to the proposition that we just round it all up to two cents and do vibrant exploration on both frontiers. I think they might like that. <laughs> okay. This uh, increasing agreement between the two teams is making me nervous. <laughs> Um, so I feel like it's kind of the bottom of the ninth inning, and Josh is up. Go, Josh. Go, Josh. Hi, thank you. So my, many of my points have been made already, but I want to tell you about two things. Um, curiosity and uh, intent desire to explore. If I think about my life, my childhood, my time studying, my time as a test pilot, and especially now, my time working for the Canadian Space Agency, I have always been intently driven by those two things. And the fact of the matter is that I don't think I'm alone there. I think that curiosity and a desire to explore are fundamental elements of what makes us human. I think that they're fundamental elements from which we have benefited immensely over the course of history. I think that they're things we have to continue. And when I look at space, I see the ultimate challenge for the curiosity of humankind the ultimate challenge. So this is a picture that I enjoy. It was taken by the Hubble telescope in its field of view are over 10,000 galaxies. It is astonishing for me to think of the fact that we live on one small, perfectly calibrated planet going around one small sun, one of hundreds of billions in one galaxy, it itself one of hundreds 
and hundreds of billions that we know are out there. It's amazing to think like that. I do think that space exploration is important. I think it's something that we have to do. I think that history will look back at space exploration as one of the most challenging things of our time. I think it will recall exploration of space as one of the most critical tasks for our generation and the generations that follow. It's something that we have to do. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I've alluded to one already. It's something we want to do. It's in our genes and our DNA to go out and to boldly push back the borders of our collective conscience and knowledge, our collective innovation, and what we're able to do. But more than that, it's becoming something, as I've spoken about tonight, that we have to do. It is becoming a survival-based imperative. We have to go into space because we cannot afford to leave in space the benefits and the opportunities that await us there. Already, we know that space delivers to us immense benefits, economic benefits, technical benefits. Life is better on Earth because we've gone to space for thousands and thousands, if not millions, of people. And that's a trend that's going to continue. We know that space is going to deliver to us innovation and discovery, the sort which we have not even been able to imagine, and it's going to happen soon. And ultimately, space is going to deliver to us a new place to live if we give it enough time. So it's an exciting time to be an astronaut. I work at NASA, I work for the Canadian Space Agency, and for my generation of astronauts, that means going, getting ready to go, farther than humans have ever gone before. It means going back to the moon in a sustainable, long-term way, and eventually it means going back to Mars. Not back to Mars, to Mars. The people who will go to Mars are alive today, and I would ask that you just think about that for a minute. So I recognize that there is a ton of challenge to going to space. I would tell you that we've never not done something as a species because it was too hard. I know that we're gonna get through that challenge because that's what we've always done. Our history on this planet is punctuated by critical instances in which as extraordinary innovation has turned something that was impossible for all of our history just like that and made it possible. I would submit to you that we've seen that in space in just the last decade and we're gonna see a whole lot more of it. We need to go to space. In space awaits us immense challenge, but most importantly of all, in space awaits us an incredible amount, maybe an infinite amount of opportunity, and for that reason alone, we simply must go. Thank you. How can you argue with a message from the heart like that? <laughs> you, well, you can, because... Um, <laughs> power of two hearts. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, full disclosure, I was born 10 days after the moon landing. I'm imprinted on this stuff, right? Like my first Lego set was the Apollo kind of moon lander, and I recently bought the Saturn V uh, Lego set rocket, and it's in my room, and I adore it. I get all that, but, but that was 1969. That was the space age. Remember that? Space age technology is coming everywhere. We did that. The Teflon pen. The Teflon pen, you know, <laughs> that wasn't so good for us, but whatever. I think space age had its time in the limelight, now it's time for ocean age. So I, Thank I, you very I much. Keep making, I keep making a similar argument, but I'm going to make it one more time and I promise it'll be the last, but you have to think historically, because we're better than that. I would hope that the first time humans crossed from Europe, well, first of all, before humans crossed the ocean, Hundreds tried, and they didn't come back, but that didn't dampen our desire to do it. There were still hundreds of more people who tried. And I would, I would hate to think that after the first successful journey was made, they sat around in a meeting like this and said that, which is to say, we've had our water age, we've made the crossing, and it's time to go somewhere. <laughs> oh, well the water well age. <laughs> I think the space age is, is uh, we are at the, so, the absolute dawn of the space age. Now, one, like of the, one of the big questions NASA back. likes to put forward yeah. is to say, everybody's, and we all ask this, are we alone? You look up in the stars, you look at those pictures of the galaxies, and you say, are we alone? And that can be a philosophical discussion or a religious discussion or whatever. The question, what Boris is really saying is, we know we're not alone. We live on a planet, we live as part of an ecosystem. It's not just us and the world, we are the world, we're part of that. 
that we are a global civilization, we have global impacts from the highest spots on land to the deepest part of the ocean. We are, we are running an experiment, but nobody's in charge. Nobody's thinking it through. Nobody's really trying to say, how do I manage this one beaker upon which nearly 10 billion people live? And that's really the challenge. It's not that this isn't important. It is. Clearly understanding cosmological questions and exploring, that's all great stuff. We've got to do some of that. It's not an either or, but it's a balance. And the issue right now is that we think we are at a point in human history where understanding the ocean is the number one thing we have to do. Not that we don't do the others, but we've got to do this and make it really front and center. That If you look at roughly one third of the world's population to, depends on the monsoon that goes over Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. That is an ocean atmosphere interaction. Nobody has a clue how that runs. And we need to answer those kinds of questions. And we can even add something emotional to this. I mean, this is really the thinking, the future, the plans we have to take. But let me come back also to just argument of the curiosity, the being there and the, the experiencing as human, this view I get when I look out from a submersible, when I dive beyond 500 meters water depth into the permanent dark, this is what I see. And it's not stars, it's life. They're flashing at us. So when we go down, this is for me the most beautiful moment in diving to see that all life in the ocean is connected. Can be small microbes, can be large squids, can be jellies, can be big fish. This bioluminescence, this world of life communicating by light and the darkness, this is the most beautiful and touching that I know about our planet, beyond us humans. Final comment from this side. Well, I just want to add that if you turn your back to the ocean, it's going to come back and bite you. Well, in space, <laughs> you don't have space shark. <laughs> and also, to come back to the 100 kilometer that most population live, 100 kilometer from the ocean, remember that no matter where you are on Earth, you are 100 kilometer away from space. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very, very good point. Very good. Okay, folks, um, we're going to give you a little bit of time to think about who you think might have, uh, before they start arm wrestling or something, <laughs> who you think might have won. But it, and while you're doing that, we're going to invite you to come to one of the two microphones on either, so either aisle and pose a question to whichever of the six people who are sitting here uh, you'd like to ask. Jay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and you student, you student, the students are here. Um, We'd like you, if, you, if the adults wouldn't mind, if there's a student behind you or uh, room for a student to ask a question first, let's do that. And students, this is your chance to ask some pretty fantastic people some questions that you might not get to ask again. So if you can get to the microphones, that would be great. Kids first. So. <clears throat> All the students just are taking a, a second seat here, so I'm going to start and try to get as many questions in as possible. Um, Antje, when you gave your first uh, opening statements, I thought I was in the wrong room, actually, because I thought it was a literary review of The Swarm, a very fantastically <laughs> written uh, book. Anyway, um, I would like to make a statement and uh, say that exploration leads to exploitation. And my question to you is, um, how do you, as promoters of exploration and scientists, how do you, or what do you do, how do you work to try and mitigate um, exploitation so it doesn't end up in disaster? I can give you one example. So one of my last uh, big missions I led was about thinking, is the future of us dependent on the deep sea minerals, the metals, valuable metals that uh, people think we need eventually to take from the deep ocean? And the process of harvesting these metals would be by massive seafloor destruction. And so what can we do today? So what can we do as scientists? We live in a framework of rules 
that we have accepted as nations and that means no further losses of species from the oceans. And so we can help looking but while we do exploration in the sense that we really cross frontiers and create new knowledge, see animals the first time, measure something like respiration of bacteria and the manganese nodules the first time. At the same time, we can form the evidence for deciding what will happen if we need to take metals from the seafloor. And so knowledge is the basis of good solutions. Knowledge is the basis of having goals and targets and doing things right. And so while we are exploring, we are setting the rules for any unwise, non-sustainable exploitation. Good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sir. We've got a, lo a lot of people um, to ask questions, so I'd like to move on if I could. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, I would just like to make a couple comments. And, uh, could we make it? Could we make it a short question? Because all the kids have to get in the school buses and get it, home it, after it, this. It'll be very short. Um, if anybody's seen the Arrow, the CBC movie on the Avro Arrow, the plane could fly so high that they had plans to flip it over and use it as a uh, launch platform for uh, rockets. And I guess I'd just like to first just um, the possibility of using high altitude aircraft as a space launch, inexpensive space launch platform. Uh, secondly, submarines are a contentious political issue in Canada. Do we need them? Do we not? Um, the ones we have now are kind of proven to be expensive and ineffective. What about the possibility of replacing them with advanced modern submarines that would be modular in design so that they could be used or outfitted for exploration and research, but if need be, converted to war vessels in a short amount of time, you know, a matter of months or something like that, again, as an inexpensive sort of um, exploration platform. But I guess my question is be, are submarines, do they have benefits that, say, robotics and surface vessels would not? Is it worth the money? Developing a system like that, so if either uh, Kathy, you've respond. been down both. I, uh, well, in I, can, I can give a quick space, answer so. to the the air launch. There are a number of companies that do air launch, uh, take a uh, rocket partway up under different airplanes. So that is something that several companies are already developing. Right now, it's limited to certain sizes of satellites, but the potential is certainly there. Um, you know, there's. Uh, there's no such thing as a new redesigned X, be it a submarine or airplane or anything, that's intrinsically cheap. Uh, you have to learn new lessons to build any new capability like that, modular or not. The running cost, once you've done that, might be less than the running cost of the current uh, um, uh, equipment. And Mark's institution has led the development of a new scientific submersible. There's still sort of the divergence between the military purpose and the civil ones, and there's an increasing vibrancy and probably convergence in more and more autonomous vehicles that if anything's going to transform both the scientific and the, the military, it will be autonomy coming into modular vehicles. Thanks for your question. Yeah. This is both an ocean and space. Yes. Robotics are the future because it's just cheaper, more flexible, can cover more ground. Uh, I had a former NASA administrator say, but we never gave a ticket, ticker tape parade to to a robot before, and I said, but you don't give ticker tape parades to astronauts anymore either. He, he didn't like that answer, Josh. Yeah. But, yeah. but I'm, a, I'm a complete defender of manned missions, I have to say, because A, it shapes the humans that get that experience, they make clever decisions, they see things in 3D and have a 4D record of what they see. So I tested everything, robots and autonomous vehicles and manned submersibles, and you can't replace everything, not every mission you can replace with robots. Our brain is just so much more clever than any robot today, and our memory also much better in image recognition, so I'm absolutely for containing manned missions in space and the deep sea. Okay, yes. So great hearing about these two frontiers. My concern is that climate change is going to be our final frontier. Mm -hmm. So my question for the two teams is which team has the best solutions for climate change? Now, I'm not talking about satellites in space or tidal energy. That's old news. I'm talking about crazy stuff. For example, space-based solar or volcano, uh, underwater volcano energy. Which team has the best solutions? So uh, I, would, I would say uh, we have to team up, not just between space and oceans, but with everybody to solve this one. To me, uh, I, I, I support your point. It is our next frontier. It is our uh, final frontier where we will see just how smart we can be. And we can only be smart by linking all of our collective ideas, aspirations, technology, our hearts and minds. If we can harness all of that to solve this problem, we're hopefully going to make it. Good. Question here. 
My question is very similar about the pollution, but it's also about what are we doing right now? Like when we send rockets up to space, there's a lot of pollution that comes off of that, but also we're leaving a lot in the oceans during these explorations. Like does one have a better solution to solve these or reduce the amount of pollution that they're releasing when they explore? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. and. Um, and we're trying. So, we, you know, the, in the analysis right now, uh, we have to go to space in order to find the, the solution to these big problems, pollution and climate change. A huge part of the reason Canada has a space agency right now is that it's part of, of where we think we may find solutions to these gigantic problems of our time. Um, and that's why we're going. Now, the, the actual act of going into space is polluting in itself, as you point out, and that's true. Rockets burn a lot of gas. We're trying really hard to, to bring that down, um, and we're making a lot of progress. We're not to where we, we would like to be right now, but we're getting a lot closer. I mean, just 10 years ago, the idea of recovering first stage boosters um, was something that in a lot of professional circles wasn't even, we weren't even sure that would ever be possible. And we're doing it routinely now, and we're doing it with a view to making space uh, exploration more efficient, less costly, and less polluting. So it's certainly on our minds, it's certainly something that we're concerned about and that we're working on, um, but at the end of the day, um, we have to go to space in order to solve these problems. Same for the ocean. We need a new ocean ethic, actually exploring the ocean. I fully agree with you there. And I saw something, just a short story. Last year, we were at Gulf St. Lawrence with an underwater submersible, um, an unmanned one. And we went around and filmed habitats that had never been filmed before and beamed it actually to everybody. It was cast on the internet, and people could ask questions about this, so it was very participatory. But my favorite moment was when um, they cut a, a sampling device off from a zip tie and the zip tie floated away. Of course, the zip tie is made out of plastic. And the submersible chased the zip tie until we had grabbed it and put it into a bag so we wouldn't <laughs> pollute the ocean. I thought, that's a new ocean ethic. Okay. So my question is, uh, where space exploration definitely seems to be a lot more like exclusive and selective and only open to like a couple of people versus the accessibility of ocean exploration. Do you think that it is more important to like conserve humankind as we are now, like on the Earth, even with Earth being, as Teen Stay said, like such a vulnerable place for us to live, or is it more important to like expand our kind into space so that we can like continue to live and to push those boundaries and like set foot on new lands and continue like. Um, research, or is that even like a decision that can be made by just a couple people? My take on that would be um, it's a question of time constants. The time constants, Mark touched on this as well, the time constants of the rate of change of the natural systems of Earth with the roughly nine billion people who live there now, uh, that is rap moving at such a pace that it certainly is imperative that we invest time and energy and money in understanding and working towards solutions to at least slow that or, or staunch that and stop it completely. This is the planet we have. And you know, life will become very untenable for very, very, very many humans on this planet much sooner than we will have any capability to take a meaningful number of people to another planet. I think those time constants are just pretty inarguable. And furthermore, the amount of treasure, national treasure, national money, that it would take to steward this planet wisely is a tiny fraction of what it will take to develop the deep space and, and interplanetary transportation and colonies on Mars, uh, fuel depots on the moon. Those are all doable, and I think they're very worthy technical challenges. There will be things we learn there that do pay dividends back on Earth. The reality is this planet will always be fine. This planet Earth will be fine. As as Christian showed, it may become something very different than it is now. The question is, how will this planet be for human beings and the societies that we have built? That question's coming at us very quickly, and that question is where we can and should devote more uh, expenditure and effort than we currently do. Great. Yes. Um, hello. My question is for Team Space, and my question is, what does space offer in way of inspiration? Because I already believe that the ocean offers much in way of inspiration, as many branches of engineering, design, and technology take after life on Earth from life that is already in the wa water and in the land. And the ocean, inside the ocean, there's stuff like plants that don't survive with 
barely any light and fish that can like, survive in under tremendous pressure. And the de debate is about whether or not we should explore the ocean into space next. But really, it's the science, the technology, and the engineering that's going to get you there. And the ocean offers much more inspiration in that way. <laughs> 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 you, you, you've just been, okay. you've just been adopted by Team Ocean. <laughs> I, I thought we were done with the debate, but it's, uh, it's a really good question. I think, you know, I, I'm biased, of course, you heard me speak, but the, I think the fact of the matter is, you, you know, space, if you look at, the, the, there's documented evidence to, of the huge extent to which um, the early space age that we had in the 60s and 70s caused very real, you know, significant, deliberate, impacts on people, on societies, frankly, and have led to some of the things that we're, we're seeing now. Um, it's a very real effect. It's not just the idea of someone growing up and, and wanting or believing that they want to be an astronaut. It's people growing up and seeing that, you mentioned the environment underwater where some microorganisms get to survive in a place that's very untenable for life. But it's, it's that same idea whereby you look up and you see that in an environment that was absolutely completely uh, impossible to sustain life in. We've now had life living for 20 years. And so that's, a, to me, a very prominent marker of, uh, in, inspirational-wise, of what humans can do when we combine forces and, and put our minds to it. I, I, in my mind, more so than, than with the ocean. I'll be a traitor to my cause and acknowledge your point about bio-inspired design, uh, which I think is part of what you were getting at. And there certainly are organisms in the ocean, as well as terrestrial organisms, from which engineers are taking more and more insight. Uh, how do you survive? How do organisms work? How do mechanisms work uh, in ways that we haven't thought about from a, from a mechanics point of view? So the bio-inspired bio design is certainly something that there will be more of from the ocean frontier than from the space frontier. Good. But Thank I you. need to support Great. space in a way, and so the knowledge we gain from the Mars mission and from, from, the, uh, from the comets we've looked at, to know that there is traces of water, traces of the building blocks of life everywhere in the universe, this is also such a great step in knowledge. It wasn't there when I was a kid or a student, and so um, I give one back to Kati. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I, there are a lot of a lot of people that want to ask questions. That was a great question. Really? I don't like to cut you off, but uh, we need to move on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for uh, two sides of an excellent debate. Um, I'm not quite sure which side I would pick, but one thing's for certain that all six of you subjectively proved throughout this past hour that humans are in desperate need of a constant source of water. Um, so, <laughs> so my main question, and it kind of pertains to a fear of if you were on a uh, space mission, how efficient is it to replenish the water supply from constant excrement and reuptake of water? How much space does it take? And that's really the two main parts of the question. I'll give you a part one from the shuttle technology and then Christian, uh, sorry, Josh can fill in from newer technologies that's in use now. If you, if you choose to generate some of your electricity from a hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell, then you produce potable water as a byproduct of the electricity, and it's pretty efficient usage of cryogenically stored hydrogen and oxygen. So replenishing water on a space shuttle was easy. Just turn the lights on. Uh, <laughs> this is a big area of research. It's a big area of research that was part of the, the original impetus to build the space station in the first place. And uh, this idea of sustaining human life in a, with a closed system is, yeah. is the idea central to space exploration. We've been working on it for a long time. You know, what does that actually look like on the space station? They've come a long ways. There's a rack devoted to this. It's fairly big. If you know, it's like six feet long, several feet wide. But at the end of the day, we have technology up there that does a, a pretty amazing job at recycling water. And it's not to the point where it's a completely closed system, uh, but it's becoming very, very close. So uh, human waste, food waste, laboratory waste, anything with water in it kind of ends up in a common pot, to think simply about it. It uh, runs through a whole bunch of technology, and at the other end, we get uh, almost as much potable water back as we originally put into the station. So we're, we're living off of recycled um, 
water. You're, you know, you're drinking your waste in your coffee. And uh, it's funny to talk like that, but it, it's very important to space exploration. But so, Josh, so, my point would be, why don't we do the same thing on Earth? Why don't we have yeah. a complete closed system or nearly closed system recycling economy and, for and, things like plastic, for and, things like food? Yeah, and it's a, it's a great point, and it's a point that I talk about when I'm, when I'm talking about why we go to space, because we go to space for a whole bunch of reasons, but at the end of the day, some of the stuff we discover in space, like how to run closed water systems, recycle water, is stuff that we hope to bring back to Earth and, and solve problems like that. So, you know, you can look in medicine fields, you can look in this field. There's a lot of examples like that of where things we had to discover for human spaceflight get turned around and, and used on Earth, and, and hopefully that will someday as well. I want to make one more point, because Christian <laughs> pointed out that uh, when I said that half the world's population lives within 100 miles of the ocean, uh, if you live in Saskatoon, you live in the ocean too, yeah. because that's the greatest water recycling system we have, is the ocean, atmosphere, land, coupling. So all of that rainfall that feeds the wheat farms out there in the prairies comes from the ocean, and so we all live in the ocean. Here I thought the debate was over, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I have a question for Team Space. Uh, how viable or realistic do you think is uh, commercial space flight in the immediate yeah. future? Or is it even safe enough? Because like, as you might have heard before, uh, there's a whole Virgin Galactic uh, space flight crash in the news a couple of years ago. It's viable now. Commercial companies are delivering cargoes to orbit on a purely commercial basis. They're working towards uh, amassing enough data and enough flights to verify and confirm that the vehicles are safe enough yet to carry people. Uh, but there are several companies that are on a good path in that direction. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very important. It has to be done safely, though. But the answer to your question is we're, we're very close. I, in Houston, I work with the people who are going to fly the first commercial spaceships, uh, and they're getting ready. This, this is going to happen in the very near term. You're, you're going to see this in the next year or two. So it, it's here. It really is. Yes. Hi. Um, at the rate that we're going, do you think, like, how long do you think it will take for us to reach Mars or for ocean to reach the bottom of the ocean? Uh, we've reached the bottom of the ocean in 1958, if I'm correct. 1960. Yeah. Yep. So, um, James but Cameron just a few years ago. and then James Cameron, <laughs> James Cameron did it again by himself, and that was it. So what strikes me here is um, once we're there, we're kind of abandoning it, and I don't know why. And sadly, well, now they're using unmanned submersibles to go down and look, say, in the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. And sadly, what we're discovering, it's one of the most polluted places of the planet. So to me, um, we've not kept uh, on watch at this place. We went down once, had done that, been there, maybe bought the T-shirt, but we haven't looked after that place. So I think we have to fill that promise. Mars, quick comment on Mars. When yeah. we'll get there? Well, I, I think you will see it in, in your lifetime, uh, humans at Mars. I really do. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Good question. Yes. So I guess one of the things that was mentioned was, are we alone? Well, I'm thinking, of course not, because I've seen Star Trek and Star Wars, and there's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> different creatures out there that a lot of them look like oceanic creatures, right? Like, yeah. And they all speak it's English. It's a trap, right? <laughs> yeah. They all speak English. Yes. So uh, anyhow, I, I have a bias, because I was born on um, Jacques Cousteau's birthday, and uh, so obviously the ocean is in my blood. Um, and I, I think, Catherine, you mentioned about eight Eighth of one penny is being spent on space? On NASA. From NASA? Um, is that the, just NASA or that the American government sort of? Yeah, of, of each dollar the, the United States spends from its tax resources, eight tenths of one penny equals a, on an annual basis the NASA budget. So how much is being spent on ocean research at the moment, do you know? Well, if you, just, if you just pick the ocean science side, mm -hmm. it's about one 30th of the whole NASA budget, which is, has science in it, but a lot of other things, like Josh's salary, so we <laughs> <laughs> So, so to, to first order, if it's eight tenths of a penny for, for NASA, it's, as I rounded it off, it's, a, it's half, point four, four tenths or three tenths of a penny for ocean exploration and science in the United States. 
Because I'm thinking about the amount of value, the intrinsic value of the oceans as much as the resource value of the oceans and how much we should be spending on that because although it's really beautiful to think that we have a billion years left of the planet, we're not going to see it. And I'd quite so, like the next hundred years to yeah. be clean. So you can so, you can join my two cents club. I mean, yeah. we'll just round it up to two cents. Yeah. Yeah. I put my two cents in right now. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So here's what I'd like to do, because we've eaten up a fair chunk of our question time. But I think if we get really short, sharp questions and short answers, we can probably <laughs> do them all. We might be run out five minutes longer than we were going to, but we're all having fun. They're great questions. They're great answers. So let's go back here and let's do that. Okay. So I'll make this quick. Um, so, A, uh, have you found any new like life form kind of things like in space and in the ocean? And my friend wants to know if uh, asking if, for a friend. Yes, <laughs> because she's losing her voice. Um, if space is so important, then how come we came here to learn about the ocean and we're like we learned about the ocean and not space? <laughs> so, so I give I give you an example for finding new life forms. Um, I was part of an exercise called the Census of Marine Life, uh, which happened between 2000 and 2010, and they went out to look for those new life forms, and they found thousands and thousands and thousands of them, including some big ones like sharks and new species of marine mammals and so on, but. Uh, most of the things we find are small, and there's just so many of them, it's even hard to keep track. Uh, one of our colleagues, he uh, looked in a block of coral about one meter by one meter by one meter, and he found about 600 species in that block of coral, half of which had not even a name, hadn't even been described. Great, good, thank you. Yes? I have a question for space. Um, are you able to make a farm like how we have down here up in space for us to survive by? So we, we, don't, we don't know yet, but we're trying really hard. A big part of <laughs> cucumbers, cucumbers. A big, uh, on, the, on the International Space Station right now, uh, we do a lot of that science. So there's a lot of science devoted to growing plants and trying to grow human food in space. So I was saying it's very challenging, but it's a focus of our research right now. And, and I think that eventually, with enough persistence, we'll be successful. We'll figure out a way to do it on a larger scale. It, it's what we've always done. We solve the hard problems, and we'll solve that one too. The, the tricky part is getting a plant to produce seeds, which they'll do, but then for the seeds to start over again and produce the next plant. It's that bit that's among the trickiest parts. If you figure it out, um, let us know. Yeah, <laughs> they'll want to know. OK, over here. Uh, my question is more for the space side, but um, with our modern technology, how far have we made it out into space, and how far do you predict we will make it with future technology? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. robotic vehicles uh, have gone beyond the edge of our solar system, the Voyager probes. Uh, humans, um, 12 humans have landed on the moon, and three others uh, have gone around it. So six others actually. So 18 people have gone to the moon and back, 12 of them walked on it. Uh, and beyond that, human beings have stayed within about 200 miles of Earth. Yeah, with our telescope, we can go to the edge of the universe. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I have two really quick questions. Um, my first is for the space team. Um, Besides Mars, are there any other planets being looked into, and if so, why? So, so one of the, it's not a planet, but it, there's moons that are very interesting to us right now, Enceladus um, and, and a few others, Jupiter, Saturn moons that we always kind of thought were dead, but recently, in the last couple of years, we've found, made astonishing discoveries there of organic matter and oceans. And so although Mars is the closest and maybe the most promising, um, there's some other places that are looking very, very exciting from the perspective of, of potentially finding life. But not any other planets at the moment? Oh. Yeah. No. no. Okay, great. Oh, sorry, did you add a second quick question? It's, just, it's, not, it's not a question, it's more of just to confirm something that I've been told. Um, this is kind of directed towards both. Uh, is it true that we know more about space than we do the ocean? 
Uh, it's, it's true that we have mapped the, uh, uh, the surface of Mars better than the depth of the ocean. That is true. So we have some catching up to do there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> That's why it's a frontier. It's just badly <laughs> mapped. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I don't think it's very fair actually for, the, for Team Ocean in this debate because we know that water covers 71% of the Earth, but the Earth is like pretty small. To put it in perspective, you could fit 1.3 million Earths into the sun. And uh, the, like the observable universe is billions of light years in size, and it keeps on expanding. So with knowing that all the unknown of the universe is so much more than the unknown in the ocean, how can you really say that like, the next frontier is ocean and not space? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> So I, I, I think we're talking about the next frontier, not the size of a frontier, right? So <laughs> the, the idea, I know size matters, but the idea is to, <laughs> to look at what's urgent and where we should go next. And uh, we firmly believe it's the ocean. Right. And unless my eyes deceive me, that line is getting longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that uh, wasn't part of the plan. Anyway, a question over here. Okay, so on the topic of our future, so um, for space, we know there's some things that we can already solve by exploring space, like making life multiplanetary. Well, with oceans, do we know anything that exploring the oceans can lead to a better future? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if you come back to the issue of what will be our solution for antibiotics, I don't know if you guys know this, but we are running out of antibiotics, and that will as already creating a crisis in the health system. So people get resilient, and then they can be healed by what we have. And so there is really rapid research from other fields, from medicine and uh, natural substances, to find solutions from, from that life we talked about. Many ocean life has a way of picking the good bacteria but not letting the bad ones inside of their tissue and we need to, to understand their secret and if we do, we really have made a big step to our healthy future. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is to Team Space. Um, do you think that the answer to more space travel would lie within the ocean? Like, say, there's a certain type of animal that has a way of getting around and maybe we could use that to develop new technology based on that? Or do you think we could just keep building the way we could, we build rockets for so long now? There have certainly been lessons taken from marine organisms uh, about propulsion, oceanic propulsion and aeronautical propulsion. But uh, any creature that lives in, in, the, in the ocean is moving in a fluid. And once you get really even about 100,000 feet above the Earth, there's effectively no fluid there. So the means of moving around are likely going to have to be different once you're about 100 kilometers off the Earth. Yeah. But we are working on diatom skeletons that are used as a bio bionic uh, a material already in cars. And so you can totally reduce weight. And much of the space technology has to do with reducing weight, and we can most likely use some of these shells of, of ocean life um, to, to reduce uh, weight and, and mass and materials. Great. Yes. <laughs> My name's Ocean. <laughs> <Hey>! <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I actually have a question. Question for, for space. Yes, yeah, space. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering if we did actually like have civilization on like planet, like a different planet, like how drastically would like the cultures of the two planets like change? <laughs> oh, that's that's a, not an easy answer. Um, I think in terms of society, we'd definitely be a pretty big news. Uh, figure out that we're not alone. Uh, but one thing that will not change from day to day is the communication. Uh, let's say your nearest civilization is five or 10 or 20 light years from us. It takes 40 years to get an answer to one of your questions. So you better <laughs> be asking a good question. So I don't think in terms of society, there's gonna be a lot of ties very quickly. So it's gonna be a very slow process, but it's gonna be definitely a very big you know, realization that we're not the only, you know, 
living intelligent species that can communicate between, you know, space. Good. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi. My question is, are we working together to grow in the depth of the ocean and both in the outer space? And if we are not working together, could the research help both parties equally? You know, that's why I actually feel we're, we're reaching some common ground, because you can't explore space and you can't explore the ocean by yourself in a, in a big way, in the way we need to explore it. And um, I think, in, as Josh has pointed out, I think, and Kathy as well, um, nations need to work together in a pretty unprecedented way um, launching something like the International Space Station, which is the International Space Station. It's not someone's space station. I think that's important. But the ocean, I think, is a very profound metaphor because there's only one ocean, right? And it connects all of us. Like, we are all part of that one ocean. There's one ocean, there's one people, there's one planet, and I feel that's really teaching us something. And we help each other already. So I had a problem with reaching a deep, deep uh, um, volcano under the ice in the Arctic. There was no robot. So I could ask NASA for help, and they built me a little robot together with Woods Hole. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Hi, so my question is for Team Space. So my question is, if we were to leave Earth and establish a human settlement somewhere else, would you suggest establishing a colony in a planet in our solar system, like maybe Mars, or maybe searching for a planet outside our solar system that's more suitable for human life, that maybe has things like water and atmosphere and <laughs> oxygen? Useful stuff. Yeah. Uh, good question. It's difficult to project. We need some, some significant developments in fields like propulsion to do that. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind when I make those historical arguments that we're going to get those developments, but we don't have them right now. We don't have a way to travel outside of our solar system in a realistic manner right now. And so until we have it, we'll have it someday. We don't right now. Until we have it, um, we're, we're kind of stuck with our next door neighbor. Tra traveling to the nearest system with current technology would take you 70,000 years. Oh. So, it, so they are very far away stars. <laughs> Mars is good. Mars is good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, go ahead. Three months. There is a growing population of plastic that is being disintegrated into na nanoscopic and microscopic size found throughout the oceans, rivers, and lakes on the entire planet. There are many initiatives and projects looking to clean up this type of plastic, such as Project Ocean Cleanup. But the one crisis they still haven't found a solution to is what to do with all that plastic. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really great question. I think you know, the public's become very aware of plastics in the last five years. I think we're still kind of looking at the, what we call the macro plastics, the shopping bags and the lawn furniture. But you're right, it's the microplastics that are the, really the thing that are getting into the food chain. Uh, that is an area of active research. We don't even agree within the science community how to measure it, so we've got to get that. Uh, laid out first, but the second part, on, and we're, a lot of people are beginning to work with various chemical companies, can we put an Achilles heel into plastic? Because it's really a useful product to have. I mean, you can imagine in terms of weight of things and replacing and sanitation and health and all the rest, uh, but are there things that we can put in chemically so that they break into the fundamental components more quickly, uh, as well as thinking about how we capture it at the sources so it doesn't come off the land and into the ocean. If you look around the world, the hot spots are where plastics are created. So really looking through the whole thing, all the way from the capture and recovery to can we just fundamentally transform how we make plastic in the first place. And that's what I like about ocean issues like ocean plastic or climate change or overfishing. These are issues that touch each and every one of our lives. Um, in a way that maybe space doesn't in a day-to-day -day way. We're all using plastics every day, all day, and we have to find a solution, and every one of us has to be part of it. So it connects us in a more profound way, I feel. Great, good question. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Hi, so my question is for both teams, and it's that, do you think that there's a timeline or deadline to find both frontiers because of climate change? Because right now it seems like extin extinction is wiping out a lot of species on the planet, which might lead to uh, less accurate research on the ocean. And same goes for space, which might be 
uh, reduction of fossil fuels, which could lead to uh, not being able to send as many rockets to space. Uh, yeah. We have a very little time left is the honest answer. And so I guess both um, need to work together. As we said before, there are ways of doing remote sensing uh, focus with new satellites on finding out where the big CO2 leaks or the methane leaks are and who is producing them. And I think uh, this is something we argue for working together, ocean and space, because uh, it is important that we understand that time is running out and fossil fuel will be for long far too cheap so that it could be a market regulation. We really have to put taxes and incentives on, on regulating the way we deal with carbon so um, space uh, scientists can really help finding out who is producing too much carbon that goes to waste and to the atmosphere. To, to me, the, the, the problems you talk about are very frustrating because if you think about it, I would say we have the technical solutions to them and we even have the money for those solutions. What we don't have is worldwide global consensus and commitment to solving them, and that's what we need. And that, that's your generation that, that has to, to, fix to hack that. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so, so seven questions. We're running over time, but you've been a great audience, very attentive, very patient. Let's get through the seven, and we'll find out who won the debate. Yeah. Um, regardless of which frontier is more important, uh, something that's definitely important is getting the public support on like focusing on these issues and how they can like, help human and like help society. Which uh, like what things do you think like strategies are like would be useful and are useful at at like catching the public's attention and getting them interested and in, invested in these in these issues? It's, uh, it's what we're doing right now, I feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just launched, last month, we launched an in initiative here at the Housie Ocean Frontier Institute called Ocean School, which is curriculum content for teachers that will come to your school and all schools across Canada to uh, get a deeper insight into oceans and maybe more um, importantly, to put you in the driver's seat of exploration. So you can experience the ocean, you can ask questions, and you can find out for yourself. You're not being taught something you are in the driver's seat finding it out. And I think those kind of initiatives we need a lot more of. Absolutely. I, I'm not supposed to answer questions, but you know, my, I've worked all my life in communicating science in an effective way to people. And I think we have a lot of research to do as well. Science communication is not a perfect art. We have to figure out ways that when we talk about climate change, it actually hits home. I think we're actually uh, some distance away from that. So it's not just incumbent on the scientists it's incumbent on those of us who actually work to bring that information to audiences that we have to do a better job too. Right. And there's one other piece that is incumbent on all of us as citizens of this planet. If the only things we are going to act upon are bits of news that are you know, hugely sexy, titillating, grab us and move us, not all the important things in the world are going to strike us that brilliantly or that forcefully. So we have to ask ourselves, to be discerning citizens, to pay some attention even to the not so flashy things. And we have to ask ourselves and expect ourselves to take the initiative to learn, go beyond what Jay shares with us, go beyond what Woods Hole puts out on their cool website or NASA on their cool website. Pick it up and turn it into something yeah. in your life as a citizen that you will learn more about and that you will act on. We can do all of these that we want and all that you do is come and listen for an hour and a half, and then go out to the reception and chat about it for 10 minutes, and then go home and turn on the hockey game and forget about it, then it will never matter that we did this tonight. So the ball is also in your court. Why isn't there an ISS of the ocean? Yeah. Great yeah. question. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. When I was a kid, I dreamt of this. I always wanted to have an ISS that stays down so that I don't have to come up to pee, but can just stay down there for months. And it's still not there. And there was a little moment of hope when uh, the Chinese uh, said they're going to build one, but they gave up with this plan right now. So hopefully you guys will build one. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, good evening. 
So due to my research, the scuba divers had died mainly because of the um, the, um, the bands. So what's a great uh, technique to deal with that? The, the bands. So you could. So the bends are when you when you go down and you breathe air and your yeah, blood saturates and you go up and it bubbles up and yeah, it causes causes illness. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how you deal with that is you go down for a very long time and you, when you go down for a very long time you come up very 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 slowly. Sometimes it takes weeks for people to come up, and they come up in pressurized chambers where they're slowly off gassing. Um, but the, to your point, we've learned a lot about human physiology and respiratory systems and, and our circulation system through that research of dive medicine. Um, under those extreme conditions, we're learning more about our human bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you think that commercial space mining will be important for the future of mankind? Yeah, I do, and I think we're, I think we're, see, we're living that right now. We're seeing it right now. Space is different. We can't look to the past and use that to project what we're going to do in the future because it's not the past, it's different. And one of the things that makes space exploration so different right now is what you're talking, what you're talking about, what you're asking about. It's a unique time because for one of the very first times we see a convergence of factors. We see convergence of technology we've never had. We're seeing a convergence of some policy around the world we've maybe never had. And we're seeing a convergence of commercial activity, venture capital interest in outer space that is going to completely change things and make it much more accessible. So it's critically important, and it's happening right now. It was a good thing. Um, with all the pressure to habitate Mars, how do you plan on uh, combating the low uh, gravity? On top of that, what is the viability of habitation of Venus instead of Mars? But, so the habit, habitability of Venus, uh, I would judge as something at or slightly lower than zero. The surface, <laughs> the surface temperature on Venus is high enough to melt lead. So right now, we don't have materials that, from which we could build any kind of habitat that could shelter human life. Um, one of the other lines of research that the space station is paying real dividends into is getting a look at, at the mechanisms by which the human body responds to gravity and to its absence. So an interesting question we don't yet know the answer to. We know how humans respond living in gravity. We know some fair bit from a few missions about how the body responds to the absence of gravity. What we don't know is if you could dial up gravity part way, a little bit at a time, how high would you need to get it to have the good effects of living in the gravity field we're used to, but not all the weight and the burden of a full 1G Earth level? If the moon is one-sixth gravity, would that be enough? Mars is one-third Earth's gravity, would that be enough? So you would certainly be able to move differently on Mars. You'd be lighter. You'd have to learn how to adjust yourself to that. But is one-third enough to keep all of your physiology healthy, the, the calcium in your bones and the rest of your body working well? Or would you need some, some um, exercise or other regimen to make up for the partial gravity? And that's right now an unknown. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Actually, never mind. <laughs> 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 on that. All right. We're done. OK, so. Um, <laughs> Before we make a decision about the debate, I have to say, you may see a lot of debates in your life. I don't think you're going to see one that's really much any better than this one. So these people deserve a big hand. Okay. Now, if you've still got enough in you to make a little noise, don't do it right now. I'm gonna, we're just gonna do this very simply. I'm gonna say, who votes for Ocean and your, well, that, that, that. I'm really nervous to invite this. Uh, make as much noise as you want. We're gonna measure it scientifically. <laughs> and then we'll do the same for space. So, who votes for Ocean?
Okay. Captured every last clap. Okay. Who votes for space? Wow, it's a tie. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'm not making a decision like that. <laughs> oh, what? Hold on, folks. So, what? Uh, wait, please. Just wait uh, two seconds. We have com we have a, com a final comment to make. Okay. So Please. I am going to keep you guys here a little bit longer, like a minute, I promise, then you'll be good to go. Um, so my name is Kate Arpin, and I'm a second year marine biology student. Sorry, Team Space. Uh, <laughs> I'm the second year rep for the Dalhousie uh, Association of Marine Biology Students, as well as being involved in some research on deep sea megafauna in one of the ocean science labs at Dalhousie. Um, I'm very honored to have been asked to do the closing comments here tonight, and what an incredible debate that was. Not to mention some particularly interesting questions, especially from the students in the audience. That was amazing. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Mr. Ingram, and thank you, Team Ocean and Team Space, for giving us so many new and exciting ways to think about the ocean and outer space above. So Mr. Ingram, on behalf of Dalhousie, uh, Dalhousie University, it is my pleasure to present you with this gift. There is one for each of our debaters backstage, and it is a blanket that has been made from the wool of the sheep at our Faculty of Agriculture located in Truro, Nova Scotia. Thank you. So thank you all again for joining us this evening. Dalhousie's 200th celebration is filled with many events and activities across our campuses. To find out more about upcoming events, you guys can visit dal200.ca. And everyone is now invited to a short reception in the Sculpture Court, which is located just outside this auditorium through those back doors. Now please join me again one last time in thanking Jay Ingram and our six debaters for an amazing evening. <laughs>